special session of the Hoover Institution's project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region. We are really delighted to be inaugurating the new academic year uh, of our program at the Hoover Institution with this special event, which welcomes to Hoover and to Stanford, Taiwan's dynamic new representative to the United States, B. Kim Shao. Representative Shao assumed her position in Washington, D.C. just two months ago after serving as senior advisor to the president of Taiwan at the National Security Council of Taiwan. She is the first woman to be Taiwan's chief representative to the United States. She previously served four terms in the Taiwan legislature. During her, Taiwan, her time in Taiwan's parliament, she was widely admired for her principle, her integrity, and her effectiveness. For many years, she was the ranking member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee for the DPP and previously the chair of the USA Caucus in the legislative yuan. She was also a legislative leader in the cause of women's rights and other human rights. And she was known for her political courage and selflessness. For example, rather than holding on to a safe legislative seat, she helped her party in 2016 by contesting a seat in the mountainous rural county of Hualien, home to one of my favorite places in Taiwan, Taroko Gorge. And against all odds, she won that seat. I first met Representative Shao some 22 years ago when she began her political career as director of the International Affairs Department of Taiwan's then opposition party, the Democratic Progressive Party, DPP. That was only a couple of years after Taiwan had completed its transition to democracy with its first direct presidential election. And no one expected to see the DPP come to power anytime soon. Yet what I saw there in the DPP office way back then was tremendous energy, intellect, and democratic determination. None more so than in the person of this brilliant thinker, strategist, and activist who, well before her 30th birthday then, was heading international affairs for the principal opposition party. And of course, two years later, the DPP captured the presidency of Taiwan. Uh, Ms. Shao then served as international spokesperson for the presidential campaign of Chen Shui-bian and after his stunning victory as an advisor in the office of the president and then as international spokesperson again for the DPP presidential election campaigns of 2004, 8, and 12. She's been a fixture in one of the most hopeful developments in Asia over the past two decades. The emergence of a truly Asian network of democratic activists, thinkers, and practitioners. She was the chair of the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats, an organization representing Asian democratic political parties, and she's played a leading role in other international organizations um, between 2005 and 2012. She was uh, the uh, vice president of the uh, Liberal International, a London-based organization of liberal political parties. Uh, she's also a founding member of the board of the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. And uh, she knows the United States extremely well. She obtained her uh, BA in East Asian Studies uh, from uh, Oberlin College in Ohio and her MA from Columbia University. I want to say that few people bridge our two societies as gracefully and knowledge as our, knowledgeably as our speaker today, uh, Representative B. Kim Shao. So, uh, Representative Shao, do you uh, have any opening remarks you want to make or any greetings you want to extend? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, Larry, for that uh, extensive introduction. And it's certainly both a pleasure and honor to be able to participate in this conversation today uh, with uh, you and colleagues at the Hoover Institution. Um, it's only my uh, second month here in Washington, but uh, 
Uh, I have had a full agenda and uh, there are uh, many issues in a very significant moment in the bilateral relationship here. And certainly my goal is, as you described, uh, bridging Taiwan and the United States uh, based on many common values, including democracy, uh, human rights, and the respect for basic freedoms. And um, so thank you again for having me. Um, I look forward to the upcoming discussion. Great. Well, um, let's get right into it then. And let me ask you about a question that's on everyone's mind, uh, uh, Madam Representative, which I think uh, leads to a larger question about Taiwan's democracy. If you kind of do a spreadsheet uh, of the impact of COVID-19 among uh, reasonably uh, advanced or wealthy countries of the world, you see that none has been done better than Taiwan. It's really become a model of health, public health management. And then, of course, it's increasingly recognized now as one of the most liberal third wave democracies in the world and maybe the most liberal democracy uh, in Asia. So what do you see as some of the key lessons at this point of Taiwan's democratic experience? Well, thank you for um, highlighting Taiwan's success or relative success in dealing with the pandemic crisis. Um, part of that came from a painful lesson uh, we learned uh, over a decade ago in the SARS crisis. And so our government and society were much better prepared uh, to deal with um, the COVID-19 in the beginning phase. Um, and the dimension of democracy Democracy, I think, is quite important in Taiwan's dealing with this because um, it brings about transparency and the need for public civil society, public-private partnership uh, in uh, confronting uh, this very challenging situation. Um, my, our government has focused on public communication, especially from the early stages, um, communicating with the public on all aspects of scientific um, understanding of the pandemic, but also on how to respond to it, including the significance of quarantine um, and um, supplies, such as PPEs, as well as um, the need to prevent panic buying uh, and uh, economic lockdown. And so we managed to get through uh, the situation with um, a lot of cooperation from the civil society. Um, civil society participation and cooperation was actually critical, especially in managing the quarantine process and ensuring that the quarantine uh, process was thorough uh, so that the rest of the society could function uh, normally. I think we are one of the few societies that manage the process without an economic lockdown and also keeping our schools open uh, since February. And um, uh, I also want to highlight another aspect, and that is um, there was some private talent contribution in technology, uh, especially in the digital tools that we used in combating the pandemic. Um, in the uh, digital fencing process, uh, for enforcing the quarantine, but also in the distribution of PPEs, uh, specifically the masks that um, were critical in preventing the pandemic. Um, the, some private talent helped to design software and applications that informed our society of uh, where they could get uh, accessible and available uh, masks. And um, uh, that whole process was very transparent. Uh, we started at a very early phase to ensure a accessible and equitable distribution of mass, and it was crucial in the process that that information was transparent. And uh, so we, we did welcome the contributions and support from civil society. And so in terms of um, um, the overall success of Taiwan so far in dealing with this crisis, um, the openness, public communication, private-public partnership, 
the participation and contribution of civil society were all significant aspects. Well, uh, I think our guests are already seeing why you've been such a uh, successful spokesperson uh, and representative for Taiwan, even before you arrived in Washington, D.C. Uh, let me next uh, ask you, uh, Representative Shao, about a, a very painful uh, development uh, in uh in the PRC with the shadow cast over all of East Asia, and that has been the crackdown on Hong Kong uh, and the increasingly brutal and relentless uh, suppression and constriction of its civil liberties and the rule of law. Uh, how, uh, you of course, offer any observations you want to make about that, but also tell us how it's affected people's views in Taiwan of cross-strait relations and maybe people's thinking about the role Taiwan may play now even more urgently as a beacon of democracy in Asia. Well, it's indeed heartbreaking to witness the images of the brutal crackdown of Hong Kong civil liberties, and especially many of those involving um, young people, uh, very idealistic uh, youth who are um, doing no more than express their hope that society remains free. And uh, that is certainly a painful process to watch. Uh, it also serves as a warning and alarm, I think, for the people of Taiwan, uh, because uh, China's violation of its own commitment uh, to basic rights in Hong Kong, um, I think, is an alarm because the model of one country, two systems uh, that had been applied to Hong Kong was also a model that the PRC had intended for Taiwan. So as we see China's violation of their own commitments, uh, it makes it harder for the people of Taiwan or for the people of any place around the world to have trust and confidence uh, in the Chinese government in any commitment that they make. Um, so um, it, it, this kind of alarm, I think, has strengthen the political resolve of the people in Taiwan to defend our democracy. And we understand that uh, while we talk about defending the status quo, which includes our open democracy, um, it's not a static situation. There are forces uh, working to influence our society, to disrupt our democracy, to also um, foster um, uh, divisions and uh, um, distrust of the system. And so there's a lot of work that we have to do to defend that. Um, at the same time, a lot of Taiwanese people are also quite sympathetic uh, to the young people and to the democracy activists of Hong Kong. And I think a lot of young people out of such sympathy are uh, quite uh, eager to be helpful uh, in uh, outreaching internationally as well uh, to support the Hong Kong democracy activists. Well, and I think you uh, were probably aware before you came to Washington and are uh, probably now experiencing in the dialogues you're having there, the strong sense of solidarity of the people in the Congress uh, and the American public feel with these struggles for democracy and with Taiwan as the leading liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's go on now to some of the momentum, some of the interesting momentum that's developing for practical forms of cooperation and maybe a, a deepening of, of the ties we have between our democracies in the United States and Taiwan. One of the newer developments has been the recent a joint 5G security declaration that was regarding the 5G telecom work. Can you uh, tell us uh, about that, the implications of that for security and uh, for um, the challenge posed by, <laughs> if I can mm -hmm. say so, Huawei? 
Yeah, well, we um, joined a 5G security declaration in a bilateral context uh, with the United States, but also in a multilateral context, um, which is an outcome of commitments uh, to the Prague proposals. And what that is was uh, a number of uh, commitments and proposals from a 5G security conference in Prague, the Czech Republic, uh, last year uh, that involves a common uh, recognition of potential security threats uh, to uh, the telecommunications system and compromises to privacy as well as the integrity of mm. uh, telecommunication systems in our democracies. So um, recently, the 5G initiative involved um, the clean network program, uh, which has multiple dimensions, uh, clean carriers, clean applications, clean stores, clean clouds, and clean cables uh, that um, has software as well as uh, hardware um, I I implications, of course. But um, from the Taiwan perspective, we had already been rather restrictive of the use of hardware and software from hostile forces. Um, at the moment, uh, the PRC government that does not um, that is not willing to put aside the threat to use force against Taiwan. And so, using our national security clause in the government procurement law, um, so far we have maintained. Um, a limitation on the involvement of Chinese um, technologies in Taiwan's telecommunications uh, infrastructure. Um, uh, but on a broader level, I think uh, the conversation involves not only 5G technology, but broader use of uh, technology. Um, the new developments of um, um, artificial intelligence, A AI, uh, the application of IoT, um, there's an increasing awareness that privacy and security are compromised by the misuse of technology as a means of suppression by authoritarian leaders. And, and mm -hmm. I think that's what brings some like-minded countries and democracies together uh, in the need to develop um, clean technology or a clean uh, use of technology that is uncompromised by um, certain authoritarian authoritarian mm -hmm. uh, forces. Mm -hmm. uh, you, of course, uh, in Taiwan, uh, were subject to some uh, cyber interventions mm -hmm. uh, and disinformation activities in your recent January 2020 yes. presidential election campaign. Our intelligence authorities are warning of such uh, Chinese Inter digital intervention efforts mm -hmm. here in the United States this year. Is there um, uh, any scope for or logic for or activity uh, developing around cybersecurity cooperation more broadly uh, between the U.S. and Taiwan or maybe among other democracies of the region? Well, uh, you're you're right. Um, all kinds of uh, influence operations, including serious cyber attacks, um, have been occurring in Taiwan in recent years. Not only in the recent presidential election, but going back several years, mm -hmm. including in the local elections. Mm -hmm. um, and such uh, operations are becoming much more sophisticated in nature. And so we have been compelled. Been uh, we have uh, been compelled to respond with measures to enhance public immunity uh, to such attacks. Um, some of the attacks involve uh, critical infrastructure, such as the uh, oil and gas distribution network, as well as uh, other government institutions. But some attacks involve disinformation, um, fake news, and other uh, sophisticated influences in social media applications within our broader society. So public immunity has also involved establishing fact-checking um, systems that are, you know, when the public doesn't trust the government, we need NGOs and credible um, private institutions to help step in to facilitate 
the provision of um, fact-checking facilities and channels uh, for the public. And today there is greater awareness of the public in terms of um, we, we cannot take information at face value. We need to do some more fact-checking. Uh, we need to do some more uh, research and get different perspectives. And so that aspect is there in our society. In terms of working with the U.S., cybersecurity certainly is an important uh, factor, an important aspect of our broader uh, security cooperation. Um, we see security in a comprehensive sense. Security involves uh, the military and defense side. It involves cyberspace. It also involves economic security, as well as a, a, a human aspects of security that includes responses to natural disasters and other challenges uh, in our society. So uh, in a comprehensive sense, yes, cybersecurity is included as an important element of cooperation. Yeah, and the larger point is one that uh, we are trying to advance in the work of our uh, emerging Hoover Institution project on China's global sharp power. I'll say a word about that when we close our uh, time together today. And in the work of Stanford Cyber Policy Center, that it's not just enough for governments to do this, that as you say, with respect to Taiwan, we need more uh, resilient societies. So um, let's talk now about some of your other goals as Taiwan's new representative in Washington and, and some of the other I issues on, our, uh, on the agenda of our bilateral relations. Um, one of them that I've I had a strong interest in personally is I think an important priority uh, for the United States and for our relationship is a bilateral trade agreement, which has been under uh, discussion, negotiation for some time. Can you tell us about what that might entail and where that stands? Um, well, in terms of my agenda here in Washington, um, as I said, I'm in my second month here, but I have a very full agenda. Um, no work from home for me. Uh, it's been <laughs> office every day. And um, although face-to-face -face meetings are uh, limited by the pandemic situation here, but um, certainly there, there is a lot to do in the bilateral relationship, mainly in three areas, the economic and trade relationship that you mentioned, but also in the security relationship, as well as a broader international participation and cooperation in other um, um, civil society and cultural and uh, medical, uh, et cetera, other areas. So um, in, in terms of the bilateral trade agreement, that certainly is a priority. Um, and uh, I'm sure you noticed that President Tsai uh, made uh, an announcement recently to deal with some very difficult um, agricultural issues that have been a sticking point in the trade relationship between our countries for over a decade. And they have been complicated to the extent that we've been through different administrations, both in Taiwan and the United States. And uh, it's been very difficult to resolve. But I think President Tsai's announcement um, demonstrates her resolve and determination uh, to link Taiwan to the international society um, through trade, uh, international scientific standards uh, that um, Taiwan has to try to meet and observe uh, are one aspect of uh, greater global links. And Taiwan's long-term economic sustainability is also dependent on strong trade relations with reliable partners around the world. Uh, we, we do have a lot of trade uh, ties with the PRC, with China, um, but we also need to have strong ties with other like-minded democracies. And that's why this trade agreement is so important. Uh, Taiwan right now is um, the first half of this year became the ninth largest trading partner of the United States. And so in our own um, economic merits, uh, we feel this uh, strong, already strong relationship uh, deserves a good 
um, infrastructure that could be provided by a trade agreement to further consolidate um, the strengths, but also to develop in future aspects, um, the 5G cooperation, uh, digital economy that uh, was mentioned in your previous question, uh, as well as um, supply chain security, uh, energy, and all aspects of our economic relationship uh, can certainly use some more um, infrastructural support. And uh, we are proactively working on this issue as one of the top items on my agenda here. Great. Well, let's talk about supply chains for a moment. Uh, you know, uh, the U.S. has uh, an alarming level uh, of uh, dependence on the People's Republic of China for a lot of critical inputs to our economy. Uh, some of them involve technological inputs like uh, microchips. Some of them, uh, many citizens are unaware in the United States, involve uh, pharmaceutical inputs for some of our many uh, medicines that are keeping people healthy or alive in the United States. What do you think is uh, Taiwan's potential to help the United States uh, reduce its dependence and diversify its supply chains? Well, um, there have been a lot of discussions on the realignment of supply chains and the need to enhance the security. And I think there are two aspects of it. The first uh, started even before the pandemic um, in recognition of um, uh, uh, violations of the integrity of technology security from IPR theft, uh, commercial espionage, and the abuse of technologies by authoritarian governments. And that highlighted a need for supply chain security in various technology products and key components there. And Taiwan certainly has a role there as one of the world's major suppliers of semiconductors and uh, other uh, technology components and parts. Um, and with the pandemic, that brings out some new challenges to supply chain security. The unexpected disruption of uh, supply chains from economic lockdowns um, as a result of the pandemic also raised the question of uh, supply chain, the broader supply chain security, but also specifically in the medical supply area. Something as simple as face masks that are not really a high tech or difficult, um, they're, they're not that difficult to produce, but um, the pandemic and the economic lockdown, um, the global panic for PPEs and the need for um, PPEs has highlighted the need for some uh, local sourcing. And so overseas outsourcing and um, the um, unreliability of um, disruptions uh, when they occur, I think has highlighted the need for further discussions. And Taiwan certainly needs to position itself uh, from the perspective of long-term sustainability of our economy in a mm -hmm. critical position as a reliable partner um, for global supply chains. And um, I, I just want to give you a quick um, example of Taiwan, the resilience of Taiwan's industry, and that is in the PPE supplies I just mentioned. Um, in the beginning of the pandemic in January, um, the production uh, and manufacturing of uh, medical masks in Taiwan was just over 1 million masks per day. Um, and within two months, we increased the production to about 10 million. And by the third and fourth months, we had 20 million masks production per day so that we had enough to supply to our citizens, but also to donate to other countries around the world. And this rapid increase in production, I think, demonstrates the resilience of our industry. It's not easy to quickly put together machine tools, the production lines, 
the um, materials and sources needed in the process of uh, such a production. But Taiwan society is very resourceful, and uh, we were able to do that in a short period of time. And of course, we are very critical in other areas, and as I said, um, semiconductors, other technologies. And so uh, we, we do have an interest in being an important part of the discussion of uh, supply chain realignment. Mm -hmm. Well, and think of how sophisticated an economy of 23 million people would need to be to be the uh, ninth largest trading partner of a country like the United States of over 300 million people. Obviously, there's tremendous mm -hmm. value added in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So that's great. What about uh, the international aspect, uh, international organizational and participation aspect of this public health crisis? Uh, mm -hmm. Taiwan, you know, uh, at one point uh, had some participation in the WHO and the World uh, Health Assembly. The PRC has been trying to squeeze that out over time. What uh, what can be done to restore a place, a vital place, given Taiwan's uh, important role in world health matters uh, in, in these kinds of international forums? Yeah, well, um, unfortunately, even though Taiwan has been trying very hard to be included uh, in the global health network, the World Health Organization and the annual World Health Assembly, uh, we have faced tremendous resistance uh, orchestrated by the PRC and their attempt to further isolate and marginalize Taiwan. Um, but the pandemic or the irony of the pandemic is that it has highlighted the significance of inclusiveness uh, in the World Health Organization and the fact that while you can try to put political board boundaries um, in isolating Taiwan, um, you cannot put boundaries on a virus or on a pandemic and that you need all all hands on deck. You need everyone involved in fighting uh, this global crisis. And um, so we have had an outpour of support, um, more um, interest in Taiwan, in our experience, in the successes of Taiwan's healthcare system, in the successes of our response uh, to the pandemic. Uh, we have gotten an unprecedented level of international interest uh, in this, and uh, so an increasing amount of um, number of conferences uh, and events and uh, inquiries. Um, and we have had more countries, uh, like-minded countries, willing to be outspoken in their support for Taiwan's participation and inclusion in the World Health Organization. Um, Secretary of Health and Human Services Alex Azar's visit to Taiwan also highlighted the United States support for that, uh, even though the U.S. has uh, made its own decision to eventually withdraw from the WHA, but their commitment to supporting Taiwan's inclusion uh, remains uh, un even until now. And um, I, I think Taiwan has a lot of off a lot to offer in this area. Uh, unfortunately, we still have many political obstacles to overcome, and hopefully, uh, there will be more countries around the world willing to recognize the importance of. Of, uh, universality and inclusiveness uh, in the World Health Organization, as well as some important other international networks uh, where this principle uh, does apply, such as ICAO, the Organization for uh, uh, Civil Aviation Security, and um, Interpol, the Organization for Fighting Transnational Crimes, and of course, many other international organizations. Um, and being excluded from these networks for now, but of course, trying hard to be part of that. Um, we also have worked with the United States and other like-minded partners in what we call the GCTF, um, the uh, Global Training and 
a, a global cooperation and training framework, a GCTF uh, framework, where uh, we have been able to co-sponsor with other like-minded countries various events to share best practices uh, to uh, provide training and support on an international level. And we have worked on a number of issues, including women's economic empowerment, digital economy, fighting uh, the pandemic, health care, and a series of other uh, important transnational issues. And so we try to be the good citizen in the world, uh, trying to contribute. And I fully agree. And I do actually like uh, Secretary Pompeo's description of Taiwan as a force for good in the world. And uh, we, we, that is exactly the role that we seek to play uh, in terms of international organizations and participation. Well, and I would say that is definitely the attitude of Democrats around Asia, a force for good in the world. Um, I want to uh, now widen the conversation, if I may. Um, I'd like to call on my colleague uh, at the Hoover Institution, Dr. Glenn Tiffert, who is uh, not only a research fellow, but is the manager of our program on Taiwan uh, uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, which is sponsoring this event. Uh, before I do so, let me thank the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in San Francisco for its support of our program at the Hoover Institution. I also want to invite, some people have already done so, uh, our viewers to pose questions in the Q&A session uh, of the um, WebEx um, a platform. So, uh, Glenn, uh, would you like to ask the representative a question? Thank you very much, Larry. And uh, again, uh, I'd like to personally welcome Representative Xiao uh, to join us at the Hoover Institution today. Um, I'd like to turn the focus to uh, strategic matters. As you may be aware, a lively debate has broken out in the United States over whether the principle of strategic ambiguity that has helped to maintain peace across the Taiwan Strait for decades has now outlived its usefulness. For example, Richard Haas, president of the Council on Foreign Relations, has recently called it destabilizing and argued that the United States should instead adopt a position of strategic clarity that makes explicit that the U.S. Would, res would respond to any Chinese use of force against Taiwan. Meanwhile, Assistant Secretary of State Stilwell has argued that the Trump administration's intensification of relations with Taiwan fits within existing policy frameworks and simply restores balance to them, perhaps making the ambiguity a little bit more credible. In light of events in Hong Kong and the South China Sea, and the expansion of Chinese military power in the region, is strategic ambiguity still viable in your perspective, or is it obsolete and even dangerous? What comes next? Well, thank you for bringing this up. It's actually uh, one of the most frequently asked questions that I have been getting recently. And I think the weight of uh, Richard Haas, uh, his position, um, adding to one side of the debate in, in this discourse of strategic ambiguity and clarity, um, I think makes the question uh, quite, the, the discussion on the question quite interesting and very much relevant. Um, I, I want to say first that um, the security and survival of Taiwan, that is key to the uh, stability of the Indo-Pacific region. And there is nothing ambiguous about that. And mm -hmm. uh, the stability of the Taiwan Strait the fact that it is in the interest of the United States and other regional partners, I think that is also a fact. Um, and I want to say that uh, we welcome Secretary, Assistant Secretary Stilwell's uh, reiteration of the six assurances uh, regarding uh, our defense relationship with the United States. It is a reality that the United States stands as the only country willing and able to be supportive of Taiwan's self-defense uh, at this stage. Um, but having said that, I think um, in the long run, the degree of ambiguity and clarity um, in this relationship and how 
the degree of ambiguity and clarity would best serve the interests of the people of Taiwan is an important question. And uh, actually, um, I have asked my colleagues in Taiwan in various think tanks to um, have a very thorough look into the pros and cons and the um, different dimensions of the strategic relationship uh, to have a further examination of, of this very important question. Um, and um, even though it's not only a philosophical issue, it's actually a quite timely and present issue. And I want to say that for the time being, given China's very aggressive posture uh, in the region, uh, especially in the Taiwan Strait, over the past few days, uh, the People's Liberation Army Air Force and their Navy uh, has made a number of very provocative and belligerent uh, moves um, uh, across the uh, ADIZ or Air uh, Defense I I ID Zone for Taiwan. And it is um, the situation is very volatile. So um, we do welcome a strong commitment and presence uh, of the United States to act as a deterrent uh, to such um, provocations that are posing as a serious threat to the stability of the region right now. Great. Uh, thank you so much for that. A lot of the questions that are coming in, uh, Representative Shaw, um, are actually about these recent provocations. Uh, and Taiwan security. I'll, I'll just preface the next question by saying uh, mm -hmm. that many longtime China specialists uh, in the United States, uh, and of course, I am not one of them, I'm not a China specialist, who've been to China many times and are, you know, not viewed as uh, uh, as hostile to the PRC are really alarmed by what's been happening. Uh, and uh, I think there's a growing body of opinion that this represents uh, an ominous change uh, in the status quo. So one of the questions that came in uh, from an intrepid uh, journalist with the Voice of America essentially asks about these provocations, but it poses it more broadly uh, and uh, so what do you expect from other countries in Asia, other democracies in Asia beyond the United States? You've alluded to what you'd like to see from the United States uh, in terms of, let's say, steadfastness. Uh, can we ask for something from other democracies in Asia? Well, I, I think the, as I said, um, the stability in the Taiwan Strait region, um, the security, the survival of Taiwan is is critical to the stability of Indo-Pacific region. And um, it is in the interest of all of the countries in the region to ensure that stability is maintained. And so I think even though the US uh, at the moment is the most, um, um, has the strongest presence um, on this matter, um, it is certainly in the interest of other countries uh, to ensure stability. Uh, what is alarming uh, to us is that the PRC's actions, um, not only in the Taiwan Strait, but uh, towards Hong Kong, um, the Indian border, uh, the South China Sea militarization there, uh, it appears that today there is less regard to international opinion and simple condemnations uh, of their actions. And uh, it re does require greater coordination on an international level uh, to respond. And uh, we've noticed that um, the U.S. is uh, reaching out to other countries in discussing the significance of maintaining stability in the area. Um, the conversations with the Australians in the Osmin statement uh, did also highlight the significance of stability in the region. And um, we do expect that to be part of broader conversations as well uh, involving other partners. Mm -hmm. um, 
You are uh, actually, I think, a sophisticated student and observer of international relations. Uh, so let me try and um, uh, integrate in a way and slightly reframe uh, several of the questions that have come in uh, in this way. Um, we're facing a kind of uh, high stakes dilemma here. Uh, if we, I'd say democracies in general, the United States in particular, um, don't stand with Taiwan uh, clearly and resolutely uh, to deter provocation and possibly worse in terms of military, uh, uh, unprovoked military action from the People's Republic of China, we risk a calamity. I mean, people have... People, including China experts, are starting to use the word Munich and uh, 19, uh, the late 1930s to talk about you know, what we're looking at here. Uh, at the same time, there's the danger. You, you understand the People's Republic of China, I think, very well, and the nationalist ambitions that are swirling around mainland Chinese society. There's the danger of possibly stoking and provoking uh, Chinese nationalism so on the mainland. So uh, how do you think we should find that balance? Should be, we be using the word containment? Uh, and you know, let's take it beyond uh, strategic ambiguity to uh, what you might advise or recommend democracies uh, generally in terms of a posture toward the People's Republic of China. Well, that's a very um, complicated question, and um, certainly each country has its own um, vantage point. Uh, for example, between Taiwan and the United States, we are aligned in a lot of common interests, including the preservation of Taiwan's democracy and sustaining stability in the region. However, we have very different perspectives. Um, the United States is a global superpower with far-reaching interests around the world, while Taiwan is um, fighting for our own survival and uh, facing the immediate threat of uh, being on the front lines of military, political, and economic coercion from the PRC. And uh, so we cooperate on the basis of uh, what is within our interests in our, and in our capacities. And so uh, from Taiwan's perspective, we have developed an asymmetrical uh, warfare strategy as a uh, main deterrence and as a means for defending ourselves. And of course, we engage in conversations with others in, in, in how uh, the broader uh, regional uh, picture uh, is also relevant. But um, in terms of your worries and concerns about how to engage or contain or the debate about um, dealing with China, I think uh, the one reality is that most of our countries are so much already engaged with China, um, including from an economic level and from a social and um, you know other levels of interaction, that it is um, a very complicated situation. Uh, any um, conflict um, would be disastrous, not only for our countries, but also for China as well. And um, uh, so more discussions perhaps uh, with the people of China. Uh, one significant limitation of the engagement strategy that has been used for many countries uh, over the past few decades uh, towards China is that um, you know, many countries are are becoming you know uh, awakening to a new reality that the expectation that China would be more open as a result of engagement is not is actually not happening, and and therefore we see a debate on you know, perhaps a new way of interacting uh, with the PRC. But one main limitation has been China's own restriction on free debate. And so I think finding channels of uh, alternative views uh, within China, um, conversations with the Chinese people, because um, a lot of this outward aggressiveness, I think, is complicated by 
um, a very opaque and uh, domestic political situation in China, especially the growing totalitarianism, um, the growing concentration of power um, within the Chinese elite is um, making the situation and nationalism um, how it is vented and how it is translated into uh, international action just so much more volatile. And, and so this is an area that certainly requires greater attention. And Taiwan is at a, um, I, I think some internationally do expect Taiwan to play a more active role because we are one of the few um, or probably perhaps the only remaining free Chinese-speaking society um, where uh, Chinese language media, um, Chinese language free debate on um, ideology, on democracy, on uh, different aspects of society um, could become relevant to also to the people of China. And um, so that's why I think it also fits into the broader argument that I started out here um, with uh, in the third aspect of my work, and that is international engagement and the need for the international community to be more supportive of Taiwan's international participation. The relevance of our democracy is significant in dealing with the different voices inside China. And I think eventually uh, dealing with the complicated security as well as political challenges that China poses for the world. Let me uh, build on that and ask you a, a question about how we can engage young people and college students uh, from the People's Republic of China. We've had over 300,000 uh, Chinese students uh, studying in the U.S. now and each year. Uh, Taiwan has been host uh, in its universities to a number of students, a growing number over the years uh, from the People's Republic of China. Some people have said, well, you know, this might be a security threat in some way in general. Um, you have thoughts about the potential for um, um, you know, broadening views by having Chinese students study in democracies like yours and ours, or how to balance the the specific concerns with the general value? Well, um, Taiwan has hosted an increasing number of Chinese students. Um, the pandemic has complicated the situation, of course, but um, I think our universities uh, remain um, open to Chinese students who are eager to intellectually um, learn and to study. And of course, there always exists a possibility of uh, different uh, security considerations. Uh, but um, from an academic standpoint, um, uh, exchanges and dialogue well, with the younger Chinese generation, I think, remains significant. Uh, we are also uh, open to Chinese tourists. Um, of course, again, the pandemic is uh, limiting uh, border um, interactions, and that is the case for all the countries around the world. But uh, before that happened, uh, we did um, um, continue to welcome Chinese tourists, although we also were involved in the risk that the Chinese government tends to use that or weaponize that as leverage to pressure our government uh, politically. Uh, they tend to use the permission of the number of tourism tourists uh, to Taiwan to try to have an influence or impact on our local economy. And so we need to put that into perspective and uh, we would welcome the normal uh, economic and tourist and people to people exchanges, but uh, we also have to be careful that that is occasionally weaponized uh, by the PRC or used as political leverage. Um, so that's why uh, diversification is so important. That's why we talk about diversification, um, not only in welcoming more international students, 
uh, Chinese students, but also some other Southeast Asian international students, but also diversification of our, our tourists, diversification of our economic relations and other people-to-people -people relations. Well, and I wonder if you might want to say something now uh, as we draw toward closing about the innovative work. I think you were there. I remember the very conference when the idea was floated um, from the president at the creation of the Taiwan Foundation mm -hmm. for Democracy, the role uh, it's been playing to um, support Asian Democrats and particularly engage young people uh, in across Asia uh, who are working in civil society and so on. Would you want to say something about Taiwan's role there? Well, I think democracy is an important part of the modern Taiwanese identity. Uh, it is internalized. It is part of our values. And uh, it is a, also a commitment uh, that many of us have in terms of uh, continuing to defend uh, our survival. Democracy is an important part of that. Um, it is also a foundation for working with other like-minded countries. Uh, it forms the strong foundation on which uh, many um, counterparts here in Washington are willing to support Taiwan. I think we have a lot of bipartisan support on Capitol Hill um, for Taiwan precisely because we are a democracy. And uh, so that is an important part of our international identity as well. Um, over the past uh, decades in the process of Taiwan's democratization. It was not an easy process. And of course, some people uh, also sacrificed uh, in the process. But uh, by and large, the creation of Taiwan's democracy that was part of the efforts of the courageous people of Taiwan uh, was supported by many friends around the world. And so we also feel committed to supporting other um, democracies uh, in the region and around the world. And that's why I was part of um, the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats. Um, the state of democracy is not in its best phase right now, I have to admit, in Asia. Um, some of our colleagues are struggling in exile or in um, very limited, restricted opposition um, the third wave of democracy uh, produced some uh, liberal countries, uh, liberal societies like ours, and I know, Larry, you're an expert in this, but uh, unfortunately, we have also seen a backslide. And some of that has to do with um, global influences. I know the Chinese, the PRC has sought to promote a model of development um, that is on the economic side, um, focused on state-led um, economic development, but politically closed. And um, uh, this is, from our perspective, a very different course of action. And I think as um, liberal democracies, we really need to continue to work on, agenda, on an agenda that promotes uh, economic prosperity that is uh, linked to open democracy and accountable government, um, transparency, and, and all of the aspects that come with um, democracy. So, and, and more efforts are certainly required. And that's one of the aspects we're working on with the GCTF project here with the, the U.S., but uh, with other, uh, through the TFD, the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy that you witnessed uh, from its founding uh, uh, over or a decade or nearly 20 years ago, um, we certainly seek to work with other partners, not just governments, but NGOs, political parties, democracy movements, and um, human rights organizations around the world to strengthen that network. Well, uh, Ambassador Shaw, I just can't thank you enough. I, you know, how, how do you top the uh, eloquence and inspiration of your uh, your closing <laughs> response? There, my favorite uh, um, question was actually a statement in this box here. Just four words. It said. 
she is so impressive. <laughs> so I would thank agree you. with that. Uh, I want to uh, thank you um, for sharing your insights and wisdom with us. I want to uh, thank President Tsai Ing-wen uh, for sharing you with the United States of America and sending uh, you here as Taiwan's representative to the United States. I want to once again uh, thank the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office uh, in San Francisco for their assistance in arranging this and their support of our Hoover Institution program on Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific re region. I want to thank your staff at the Taipei um, uh, Economic uh, and Cultural Representative Office in Washington, D.C., for helping to arrange this. Uh, I'd like to let our audience uh, know and let you know uh, that we um, are going to be launching a new program on China's global sharp power. That's a little bit that we will do at the Hoover Institution to try to improve understanding and raise public awareness of uh, the challenges we face. Our first event in that regard, which will shortly be advertising, will be uh, an interview uh, between Condoleezza Rice and uh, uh, Chris Patton, the last colonial governor of Hong Kong. And then we will be having a four-part conference on the rise of digital authoritarianism, China, AI, and human rights that will engage many of the technological issues you spoke of. And in October, we will have a six-part conference in lieu of our usual annual conference uh, of the Taiwan uh, program uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and we'll be uh, letting your office know about it, and we'll be letting uh, the people on this um, uh, on this web uh, WebEx event know about it. Um, Ambassador Shaw, once again, thank you for uh, sharing your time and your insights with us. And um, we wish you a highly successful tenure in Washington, D.C. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I um, certainly would look forward to working with you as well as many others here in the United States. Thank you. Great. And at some point, we will welcome you to our beautiful campus. Thank you all for joining us and have a good weekend. Mm -hmm.